what do you know? My name wasn't on those titles. I'm the guy that's supposed to get this discussion rolling. A big subject, too, the USA and world trade. Now, where shall we begin? Why, steel and oil. That's a pretty good start already. Riding a freight along with that stuff may not be the most comfortable way to see the country, but we'll probably learn far more than by taking a streamliner. Well, let's us swing aboard, too. Well, Carlos, the 872, 65 cars to pick up the deport. Final destination, Frisco. certainly quite a trip. Must be that a lot of this stuff's going overseas. Now what about this foreign trade? I've heard a lot of people asking, does it do us any good, or is it just charity to the rest of the world? Hey, what are you doing here? We're trying to find out about foreign trade where it's going to, who's buying it, uh, what's the point of it all? You've come to the right place, mister. We take stuff from where they make it to where they need it. Ten million tons from this yard alone. Everything from an orange to a tractor going to 25 different countries. Why we export to patrol in this country. If it wasn't for the railroads, the points and marine wouldn't have any cargoes. Great thing, get what I mean? We get the general idea, but uh, we'd like to move around a bit and ask someone else about foreign trade. Maybe we could speak to some of the people abroad who built that stuff on the flat cars. Perhaps there's someone right here on this train who could help us. He seems interested. Uh, excuse me. What's all that foreign stuff doing here? Those uh, United Nations people moving in? You don't approve of the United Nations, sir? <laughs> Too many foreigners. We got no business getting mixed up with them. Have we not? Just a moment, sir. I couldn't help overhearing your remarks. That foreigner thing now, uh, that bothers me. Back in 1940, when we took eight bombs one night in this here part of the plant, you didn't think of us as those foreigners then. I beg your pardon, but uh, not all of us understand French. Uh, could you? My English is not too good, but I'll try. <laughs> in the war, many nights, I helped guide your bombers to find bridges and railroad tracks. And now, uh, we need the materials to get them going again. Exactly. The important thing is, those bombs were pretty rough on old Betsy here. And we had to call in a welding expert to fix her up a bit. Trouble is, she won't stay fixed. What I hope is she'll hold together until that new one outside your dining car window gets here. You couldn't ask the locomotive driver to uh, hurry it up a bit, could you, sir? Why, this is preposterous. I never heard of such a thing. Take it easy, Mac. I built that new lathe he's waiting for. And if you knew anything about machines, you'd say it's a crime to expect a good man to turn out work on an old wreck like he's stuck with. That limey needs new equipment, but fast. Thanks, matey. I appreciate this is fine. it. <laughs> Everybody being so chummy and whatnot. But that blinking lathe on the siding out there ain't no gift. We've got to pay for it. And the only way we can get the money is to sell some of our stuff to you. How are you Americans going to feel when our goods turn up in your country? Uh-oh. That don't sound so good to me. Maybe we should have kept that lathe right here in Cincy. I mean, that guy needs a new machine, all right, but I don't want to see some American lose his job on account of what that limey's going to make on our machine. Yeah, yeah, but we have to import food, so that means we have to sell goods. Qu'allons-nous faire si ça ne vient pas d'Amérique? Il faut bien tout de même tout le trouver quelque part. Hey, now wait a minute. We have obligations. I'm not going to be the fall guy on this deal. Just a minute, boys. Looks like we've got to find out where we are. Some of our friends abroad think we should send them all the machinery they need. 
But our people at home are afraid that the goods made on those machines are going to compete with our own products. I think we've heard most of these arguments before. It's high time we called in someone to give us the facts. This is Dr. Winfield Riefler. Uh, he's an economist with a lot of practical experience in foreign affairs. Uh, think you could help straighten us out on this, Doctor? You're right. All this did happen before, unfortunately. As a matter of fact, it's all been well documented. Shall we take a look at the record? Here are the figures for 1920. In that year... Couldn't we have something a little more exciting? Uh, this is a movie, you know. Why, certainly. I have a film right here that ought to make things much clearer. For ten years after the First World War, as today, there was a great demand for our products all over the world. This scramble for world markets resulted in some pretty short-sighted thinking. For instance, some people reasoned that all we had to do was to get our products onto ships bound for foreign ports and prosperity was guaranteed. They forgot that a lot of this business was done on credit. We wanted our pay in dollars, and the only way the other fellow could get dollars was to sell us something or to send us gold. From our point of view, everything was rosy. But from the other fellow's point of view, things looked entirely different. Because our tariff made it difficult to send us goods, other nations had to ship us gold. Gold? What's the matter with gold? Why, nothing, so long as it keeps moving. But in return for our goods, we were getting more gold than we could possibly use. In fact, we ended up with two-thirds of the world's monetary supply. Some guys dug this out of a hole in the ground in Africa. And now we're putting it back in a hole in Kentucky. I don't get it. That's just it. Nobody really got it. Only the countries that had gold could buy freely from us. The others had to take their goods elsewhere. Foreign trade dried up, and this accentuated the worldwide depression. Now look here. Don't blame our depression on lack of foreign trade. It couldn't have been that important. Everybody knows that our foreign trade has always amounted to less than 10% of our total business. If you ask my friend Paul Hoffman, I bet you he'll back me up. No, J.B., I'm afraid you're wrong. The crippling of foreign trade was not the only factor in the Depression, but it was an important one. As for that 10%, uh, that's an overall figure. In many industries, ours, for example, the figure has run much higher. And that extra production for export is a very vital factor. It not only means more jobs in plants like ours, but it also means lower costs or lower prices for the home market as well as the export market. Well, uh, if he says it's good, it must be okay. Hey, wait a minute. What about all this manufacturing machinery? Isn't that setting our competitors up in business? Well, uh, we ship a lot of machinery to South America. Uh, let's see what people down there think about it. You know, this worries me. Pretty soon your people are going to have so many factories of their own that they won't be buying from us anymore. All these ships bringing in manufacturing equipment will be making half their trips under ballast. No, my friend, I don't see it that way. You see those fellows over there? They're working for 80 cents a day. But the wages in our new factories are much higher. Don't you think our people would want more cars, radios, and refrigerators? Just as much as your stevedores do. All right, but uh, in the future, won't you make everything you need? We can never compete with your mass production industry. The more industrialized we become, the more our people will want to buy and be able to buy. Have no fear, Captain. I'll be wishing you and your ship many a bon voyage. If these people haven't got dollars to pay us with, why should we send good American stuff out of the country without getting something useful in return? Anything useful? I've been trying to explain. You can't convince that guy by talking to him. Why don't you find out where that shipment's going? 
Hurry up. We're not going to be here all night, you know. That was the quickest trip to Cleveland I ever made. Uh, hope you mind the intrusion, but uh, are you expecting a shipment from Switzerland? You mean it's here? Where? When? Uh, take it easy, old man. We only saw it on a flat car 800 miles away. But um, what's the deal? Uh, why did you have to get it from Switzerland? Don't we make every kind of machine right here in Cleveland? No, I'm afraid not. Nor even in the United States. Not many people realize it, but quite a bit of our uh, specialized equipment is made in Europe. Some of our largest, like that monster you saw flat car, and some of our smallest. Now these chains, you won't find made in America on them. The ones this size come from abroad. <laughs> you look surprised. Well, I'll bet you your 10-year-old son could list a lot more stuff we need than you could at his age, both raw materials and finished articles. Invented since you and I went to school. Hey, where are you going? Uh, to settle accounts with our friend in the dining car. Remove that coffee. It's from Brazil, and the gentleman doesn't approve of foreign products. And that cigar, sir, it was made in Havana. Surely you aren't going to smoke that. What's this? A silk necktie? Away with it. Are you aware that the works in that handsome watch on your wrist came from Switzerland? And your suit, sir. Uh, I understand your embarrassment, but off with it. <laughs> you certainly did a job on him, but he had it coming to him. There's something that bothers me. I know other folks need our stuff, and I suppose we need some of theirs. What I don't understand is what I'm going to do when the fellow across the border sends his stuff here cheaper than I can grow it. Seems to me I ought to be protected somehow. But amigo, if I cannot sell my products in your country, how can I get dollars with which to buy some machinery? How about that? Pedro don't get his tractor, and maybe I lose my job because this guy wants protection. No, I sure don't want anyone to suffer. But how can I compete with someone who gets only half the wages that I get? Is that fair? There's something fishy about this low wage argument somewhere. Our wages here in the North are way over what you get. And where would you be if we started yelling for protective tariffs against your part of the country? Ah, it still don't make sense to me. I think they've got something there. People do get misled by the cheap labor argument. Look, I'll show you why. like us guys making automobiles. You know, in England, the same assembly line job pays about half what we get, but their cars cost twice as much. Doggone, I still don't know where that leaves me. Well, let's let some sunlight in on our friends' problems. And while we're about it, let's get some fresh air for ourselves. You remember those walls, those tariff walls, that some people, both on farms and factories, would like to keep along here. Yet the protected industries are not the ones that contribute most to our American standard of living. Many of them are sick, protected at the expense of our efficient enterprises and the consumer. Yes, it's about time you got around to me. Aren't the consumers the ones who have to pay for all this protection? Perhaps you could explain that. 
we are paying out billions of dollars extra a year for goods which could be produced more efficiently and cheaply abroad. Those are the things we should make up our minds to import and concentrate our own efforts on agricultural and industrial products that we can turn out more efficiently than anyone else. There's a whale of a lot better pay and a better chance for your kids in an industry that stands on its own feet and is not propped up by tariffs and subsidies. And that goes for agriculture too. You mean I should grow some other crop? That's right. As a neighbor could help our farmer friend adjust himself to new conditions. That's one thing our government can do. And purposeful thinking is just as necessary on an international scale. Today, fortunately, in the United Nations, we've got a fighting chance to bring order and common sense into our trade relations with other countries. Here we are, right on the floor of the Economic and Social Council. Let's move in closer where we can see and hear better. Reprend presque intégralement le texte qui a été voté à Londres par la commission préparatoire de la conférence du commerce et de l'emploi. L'organisation pour l'agriculture et l'alimentation a adopté une résolution. I think the drift is roughly this. We now have a permanent forum which can thresh out the national differences which so often in the past led to trade wars. The duty of preventing the use of destructive trade practices and of uh, encouraging the expansion of world trade on... You know, these delegates represent more than 50 different nations. We've come a pretty long way from the time when countries altered their tariffs and trade agreements without any regard whatever for the well-being of their neighbors. In fact, it seems to me the peace and welfare of our world today are going to depend very largely upon the measure of their success. Well, that must be our train. Hey, I'm about to get the signal for a clear track. And there were a couple of things I wanted to say to you before I go. You know, we just can't dump all of our problems onto their lap and then forget about them. It seems to me that if we hope to keep the wheels turning, we've got to see that everybody everywhere gets a fair chance to stay in business. Or keep a job just like we want to. And this foreign trade now, it's like a round trip. It works best when there's a full load coming and going. Doesn't that make sense? <laughs>